there we go. First thing we're going to talk about is a solenoid valve. Um, we've all seen these, I'm sure. An electromagnet opens and closes a valve to stop and start refrigerant flow. Come on. Whoever that is, can you mute your phone? Is that you, Jim? <laughs> I like the beard net. Yeah, sorry. I'm <laughs> muted. Sorry about that. You're good. Hey, Zach. We're still uh, we're still sitting on the first slide, so just to give you a heads up. Okay. Let's see. Let's try doing this again. Stop. Share. Now what do you see? That's better. You see the body of the valve now, everybody? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, we'll get rolling. So the solenoid valve is composed of two parts. You have the valve body, and then you have the coil that does the actual, you know, action of moving the valve up and down. You've got your plunger housing, the needle, the seat, and solenoids are directional, so make sure you're paying attention to that if you're ever installing a new one or even troubleshooting sometimes. They do get put in backwards, so don't rule that out. If a solenoid valve is put in backwards, they don't function, function properly. You will not. It, it'll flow by no matter what. If that valve closes, it'll still feed past because the way they're designed, it's designed for the pressure to come in and push down on the seat. So if you have the pressure coming in this way, it's gonna push that seat up and it'll still flow by even though that, co that solenoid coil is de-energized. Magnetic coil energizes, plunger rises, refrigerant pressure lifts the seat, fluid flows through the valve, magnetic coil de-energizes or no power, the plunger will fall, the refrigerant pressure closes the seat and no liquid will flow through the valve. Do all of you, let me turn my camera on real quick. Do all of you have one of these? Can everybody see that? It's a little tool you stick on top of a solenoid coil and if it's energized, that little circle right there will spin. It's the easiest way to tell whether or not it's energized. It's a lot more accurate and a lot better than doing the old dragging the screwdriver across it trick. If you guys don't have one and you'd like one, let me know and I can get some ordered for everybody. It's definitely a good tool to have. I'll, I don't have one. Okay. Everybody that doesn't, shoot me an email or a text and I'll get a list put together and get some for you. This is going to break down the inside. Um, kind of the same thing we already saw, but just a better view of it. You got your seat the needle that pushes down on the seat, the plunger, and then there's a spring up on top that when that, when that coil de-energizes, the spring gives it enough force to just give it that little push down, and then the pressure does the rest, and pushes that seat down. If you ever have a solenoid that's leaking by, um, a lot of them you can take apart. Um, not all of them, but some of them you can. You can take them apart, and you can actually pull these parts out and you can see if there's any debris stuck in there, shavings, you know, I've seen silphos in there from uh, wells getting sucked in too far, uh, all kinds of stuff. So, shows the gas coming in, magnetic coil energizes, plunger pulls up, pressure pushes the seat up, and the fluid flows. Power off, the coil de-energizes, Drops that seat, pressure pushes it down to create that seal, and the fluid stops. The refrigerant in the suction line during an off cycle can cause problems. It may migrate to the compressor oil, the compressor may be damaged on startup. A pump down removes refrigerant before the compressor shuts off. This will show you a diagram of how the pump down works. So first you have your T-stat, Liquid line solenoid, low pressure control, 
thermostat calling. The compressor is still running because the liquid line solenoid is still energized. As soon as that T-stat satisfies, it's going to take power away from that solenoid, close it off. Compressor will continue to run until that low pressure control hits the desired set point, whatever we have it set at, whether it be 5 pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, whatever it is. Pumps down, pumps the refrigerant into the receiver, and stops at that solenoid. Somebody have something to say? Hey, Zach, I'll pop in real quick. Is there any way you can switch to just uh, full screen mode or something? We're showing uh, both slides, so it makes it kind of hard to see from a distance. Let's see how I can do that. How's that? That's better. That's better? Okay. Any questions on this cycle here? How it all works? Uh, anything anybody doesn't understand or wants to go into deeper? Okay, moving on. Restart, temperature rises in the box. That's going to tell this that it needs to close. Once that closes, gives power to your solenoid valve, opens back up, lets the flow of the refrigerant go through the coil, up to the compressor, hits that low pressure control, pressure rises, closes the switch, and the compressor will restart. refrigerant goes back into the system. It's pretty simple. Improper in installation. The flow direction is marked on the valve. Look for an arrow or the word in, or if you have the valves that the inlet and outlet are two different heights, the one that's higher will be the inlet if you don't see the in or the arrow on there. Um, if it's installed backwards, the refrigerant will leak through, just like we were talking about. This is going to show what it does when it's installed backwards, even if that coil is de-energized. If it comes from the wrong side, the force of that gas will still push that up and it's just going to blow by no matter what you do. Nice flare nuts. We all like flare nuts, right? <laughs> Sounds like a leaking nightmare. Yep. Pump down controls. Solenoid valves control the refrigerant flow. The most common uses, um, automatic or continuous pump down. The unit pumps down until the LP control or low pressure control stops the compressor. This is going to show you a diagram of how the wiring goes. Whenever you guys are checking one of these switches to see if they're open, easiest way is just throw your meter on voltage and test from here to here. If you read voltage, if you get 110 or whatever it is, um, you will, you know, that tells you the switch is open because you're reading the power coming in and you're reading the, the other leg because the switch is not closed. Now, if that switch is closed, you're essentially reading the same wire, so you should read zero. Same thing on the thermostat. Thermostat satisfies, opens up that switch, de-energizes de the solenoid valve and the system will pump down. Low pressure con control opens, takes away a leg of the control voltage for the contactor and the compressor shuts down. If the pressure in the system rises, the compressor will restart. That's why it's important when we're setting up our low pressure control, you pay attention to the differential. You don't want it to shut off at five and turn on at 10. You're gonna sit there and short cycle the compressor. You wanna make sure that you've got it like, you know, pumping down, shutting off at five and coming back on at 25, something like that. 
Solenoid valves are also used in hot gas bypass to raise the evaporator temperature or defrost the coil in a freezer. Hot gas is a really popular uh, defrost for supermarket applications. It's essentially a uh, free defrost. Doesn't take a lot more energy to do it. It's using a hot gas that they already have and just pumping it backwards through the system and using that to melt all the ice. This is gonna show you how a hot gas is piped. You've got your discharge line. Normal operation is gonna go through the condenser, but when that hot gas solenoid valve opens up, it'll let that flow go through the bypass valve and into the distributor of the expansion valve. So it's essentially flowing the same way. It's just, instead of going through this whole process and the expansion process, it just puts that hot gas right into the evaporator. A head pressure rate regulating valve or an HPR valve will keep the head pressure up in low ambient, backs up the refrigerant or floods the condenser, acts like an overcharge of refrigerant. The compressor has to raise the head pressure. They're also called holdback valves. That's what most people call them. That's what I've heard them called most myself. An HPR valve in a warm ambient temperature. You got 80 degrees outside. This shows your normal operation going through the condenser. The head pressure is above the valve rating. <clears throat> Valve's fully open. Does normal operation through the receiver just like we would all the time. In low ambient, <clears throat> that valve is going to switch and it's going to close that plunger. And instead of the gas going through the condenser, it'll just bypass straight to the receiver. You do see these uh, headmasters or HPR valves go bad from time to time. The easiest way to tell is just with your hand. Stick your hand on this side and this side, and if it's warm outside and your head pressure is above whatever rating it is, if your head pressure is above 150 and you have hot gas coming out of the bypass of your HPR valve, that's a good indication that it's either stuck or just completely gone bad. Just make sure when you do that check that you have a good charge on the system and that your system is in optimal condition, clean condenser coil and whatnot. When you have an evaporator pressure regulator or an EPR, uh, the purpose is to keep the evaporator pressure and temperature up, maintains a stable product temperature. It's located on your suction line, senses the evaporator pressure, opens on the rise of the inlet pressure, Sporlin calls it an ORI valve. See these in supermarket applications a lot as well. Not this exact type. We use these a lot for medium, for dual temp cases when you want to change from medium to low temp. This is a large EPR with a pilot valve. The pilot valve uses system pressure to help change valve positions. That will open and close based on uh, temperature, just kind of like a, it's a suction stop basically. Um, the evaporator number one, walk-in refrigerator, 25 degree evap temp. Uh, evap two is a candy case with a 34 degree evaporator. Where would you install the EPR? It is near the highest temperature they're used to raise the pressure. So you'd want to put it on the one that you want to be warmer. This will show you an EPR application. You got your walk-in cooler, 35 degree box, 25 degree evaporator, candy case, 50 degree box. You stick that on the suction line for the warmer case and you can adjust that. You take that little cap off and there's an Allen screw inside gauge up here get your pressure to the desired pressure you want to maintain whatever temperature you're looking for. Um, kind of just the same thing we talked about, adjust the EPR valve to 60 PSI in the evaporator, the candy case will maintain 50 while the walk-in pulls down to 35. EPR adjustment shows you a cutaway view. 
The four adjustment, they're the same, just flowing freely through the valve. If the adjustment is needed, after the adjustment, the valve will now maintain a 60 PSI EVAP pressure or whatever you set it for. This will show you an electronic EPR. These are pretty cool valves. Um, depending on the model, they can have anywhere from as low as I think like what would you say, Jim? What's the lowest one you've seen for steps? Like in the 300 range, 200 range, all the way up to somewhere around 1,000? Oh, there's some that are 12,000. So. 12,000, okay. They just have little tiny steps depending on, this goes to a controller. It'll tell, tell the valve to open or close depending on the pressure. Um, Sporlin does make a tool that you can buy. Uh, you hook these four wires to it and you can manually open and close this valve. We have one here at the Salt Lake office. I'm not sure if everybody else does, but it's a nice tool to have when you're troubleshooting these valves. You want to see if they actually work or not. Um, a crankcase pressure regulator or CPR valve looks like an EPR, but it closes on the rise of the outlet pressure, some, sometimes called a CRO valve or you'll, you'll, you'll hear people refer to it as, as a crow valve or a crutch valve too. Um, located in the suction line near your compressor, senses the compressor, the compressor crankcase pressure, keeps the crankcase pressure down, prevents the compressor overloading during a hot pull down after a freezer defrost. I'll show you some pictures of a few of them. In from the evaporator, down to the compressor. The freezer hot pull down, the compressor shuts off during a defrost. Defrost heaters warm the freezer evap. The evap pressure and temperature rises. After your defrost, the compressor starts. The high evap press pressure can overload the compressor. Show you with your evaporator at 55 degrees, 115 PSI. You get 115 coming back to the suction side of the compressor. Sometimes it can cause problems. So you install one of these CPR valves just before the compressor. Lowers that pressure and makes it easier for the compressor to run. Less stress on it. How do you calibrate those, Zach? How do you calibrate those valves? Same way as the others. I go back. You gauge up here on the suction side. Um, you go between the two suction points, but this is the one you're trying to get to. It's got the same cap with an Allen screw inside it. Um, you want to maintain a, what, 16 to 1, Jim, right? Compress compression ratio. Uh, you're trying to shoot for like more of a maximum of 8 to 1. When you guys set those crow valves up, you want to put it into a full defrost and get your amp clamp on the compressor itself. And then when it comes out of defrost, you wanna make sure that you don't, aren't pushing the amps over amping that compressor. That's how you set those up. So if your amps are too high, you're gonna close it so that it, it doesn't allow as much pressure build up in defrost if, or, or flow through that valve. As, a, as the inrush coming back out of defrost, if there's not enough and you need to put a little bit more load on it, you'll know if it needs to be open more because you won't, you won't reach your optimal temperature in the case. This will show the standard conditions. Freezer at minus 20 EVAP is 16 PSI. Coming out of a defrost. Evaporator at 55 degrees um, with 115 PSI, the inlet. Excessive pressure can trip compressor overloads. That's why they use those. You want to adjust it when the evaporator is warm. It's just what Jim was talking about here. And install your amp meter on the compressor, close the front seat, this, uh, close or front seat the suction, suction service valve, and start your compressor. Open the service valve until the compressor is, is drawing only 10% above rated load amps or RLA. 
Uh, adjust the CPR until the compressor draws RLA. Note the pressure. It is the maximum the valve allows. And then you want to backseat the suction service valve. So this is showing a diagram of what we just talked about. The compressor amps dropped to the run or rated load amps. And with the lowered crankcase pressure, you want to use an amp meter for accurate adjustment. You can get all that data, what it's supposed to be off of, just off of the compressor. Um, should be on the nameplate. If they're worn off, um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. A water regulating valve is used on a water cooled condenser, maintains your head pressure by regulating the water flow to the condenser. We don't see a whole lot of water cooled condensers, but they are still out there. See them on ice machines quite a bit in little kitchens. Um, water regulating valve, incoming water to the condenser. For some reason, the valve is not there. You guys don't see it, do you? I don't. No, it's not there. Okay. Not sure what happened there. <laughs> That's the new energy efficient model. It's invisible. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> new tech. There we go. Here's an exploded view of a water regulating valve. The spring. The adjuster, the valve body, the guts of the valve or the seat, bellows assembly. Ball valves, we've all seen these. Uh, this right here is why it's so important to rag them off when you're welding these in or sweating them out, uh, anything with heat. You will melt these seals right here. So if you just installed a new ball valve and you close it and it's leaking by, if you didn't rag it off, that's why. Low restriction when open, only a quarter turn needed for a positive shutoff. Questions and discussion. Apparently there's no questions, no review questions with this one. Anything else you guys wanna talk about? Anything you like to add, Jim? Hey Zach, this is Sean up in Idaho Falls. One of the things that uh, might be good to point out on uh, ball valves, that uh, the cap on the ball valve is actually important. I know a lot of times that uh, ball valves are getting uh, turned on and off, but then the, uh, the ring or the ring around the stem isn't being tightened back down. That actually is the seal or part of the seal. So please, uh, as a good standard of practice, make sure we're tightening those caps down or those uh, the rings around the uh, the stem. Just snug it up. We've had uh, we've had a few leaks, and it's been uh, nothing more than you know a lack of tightening that up when we get on stores. So I'll, I'll jump on top of that. Like you guys, when you guys are getting on your king valves as well, like I've seen a lot of them super tight to even run them in you don't need to get on that thing super hard. It's got packing there. So if you just tighten the packing on those king valve, if, if it's a packless king valve on like on the smaller systems that you see at Maverick, then fine, don't touch it. But at most, at most of your markets, there's a little packing, uh, aluminum packing there at the base of that uh, king valve. So, and the other thing is, is please, please never use channel locks on a service valve ever. So let's make sure that we got service wrenches in our toolkits. And you know nothing. Nothing frustrates us more than when we get up on these things and we can't, we can't close them or shut them be, because somebody got on them with a pair of channels, and McGilla Gorilla freaking decided to back out as hard as he could. So you, all you need to do is go snug, uh, on the back seat or the front seat. You don't need to get on it hard. If it's leaking, or 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 leaking by, then your seat's probably out of true or, or um, it's scored somewhere in the valve there. And also, like, when you guys are running those things in and out, the last thing you guys should do is just make sure that packing at the base is tight. That's on all these valves. So make sure your nuts on your ball valves are tight. There shouldn't be any caps or screws missing off of our racks. 
So no thumb screws, no valve, or I'm sorry, no thumb caps, no valve caps, none of that stuff. If you guys are walking racks and you see missing caps, please make a note of it and let's get some caps on those things. Those are potential leaks. Any other questions or comments, guys? That was kind of a short one today. Hey, Zach. Yep. Can you uh, go ahead and pop back to uh, the uh, head pressure regulator slide? Since we're since we're coming into that season where these valves are uh, are typically found to be defective uh, this time of year, as we we really start to cool down. Uh, if anybody wants to add some more information onto those as far as testing rather than, than kind of rushing through, um, seems like we end up doing uh, at least two or three during the, the winter season, whether it be on an ice machine, a lot of the uh, walk-in coolers where they're running a single uh, condenser fan, they're going to be using that uh, the head pressure regulator because we're going to continue to run that uh, condenser fan for the compressor cooling. So they're out there, at least, you know, everything that we run into, there's a, a good chunk of, uh, of HPR valves in the market. So guys, what, the, what an HPR valve does or a, he, or a headmaster does, is it does the same thing whether it's a large system or a small system. So it's doing a couple things. It's either, it's on a, on a hold back valve, it's, it's stacking gas in the condenser. And so what we see on ice machine applications is, you know, we were out there in the summer, we made a repair, we put enough gas in it. You need less gas in the summer to push through because you need less condenser area uh, to stack refrigerant in. So you can run just fine with less, ga less refrigerant. And then all of a sudden we get a cold snap and those headmasters start doing their job and they start um, bypassing and then pull them back refrigerant into the condenser. It does two things with a headmaster. And so what happens is, is we'll get a call on a, on a freeze alarm or we'll get a call on it's not producing enough ice or we'll get a call where the ice machine locked out on a safety. What it is is it's not, it's undercharged or that headmaster's gone bad. This time of year when we have warm days and cold nights is when the headmasters modulate the most. So in the spring and fall is when we, our hold back valves and our headmasters are put to work. So when it's really cold, it, it, it doesn't throttle back and forth as much. And when it's hot, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's wide open all the time. So it's never bypassing. And so what you guys need to understand is like what that's doing is it's stacking liquid refrigerant in the, in the condenser to take up space and capacity for condensing. And so as it does that and holds back refrigerant, there's less in the receiver and there's less down at the at the uh, the coil where it should be. And that's what we get in, with stacking. So when you guys are dealing with headmasters, first and foremost, make sure your system's clean and running in OEM spec condition. Clean condensers, clean blades, clean fan motors. You know, everything's in optimal working condition. Second, uh, make sure that your refrigerant charge is adequate. So a lot of guys misdiagnose headmasters. It's probably one of the most misdiagnosed things because they, they thought, oh, it's been running fine this, all these months. Well, yeah, now we're cold. Now we need more refrigerant in the system to be able to stack and, and, loose, and run or keep our pressure up in that condenser. So you might need to add a little bit of charge. Once you've done those two things, if you're still having issues with your headmaster, then go ahead and clip the pigtail. So see if it goes into full bypass or if it leaks out the diaphragm or whatever, you can always put a stick straighter back on there and then recharge that head, leave you enough to weld on, and you can recharge that head back with nitrogen. So not, not any other gas, just nitrogen. You can, you can recharge that head, diaphragm on that headmaster with a stick straighter. So if you clip the pigtail, if you leave yourself enough, you don't have to change the component. You can put a stick straighter on there and you can recharge it with nitrogen. Done it a 
a thousand times. It's how we used to do the Albertsons headmasters. So, but if you guys need to really understand what those headmasters are doing because they're very misunderstood and they're very misdiagnosed in this trade. And now how much nitrogen? Uh, enough to where it's set for. So if it's 180 PSI um, headmaster, then you're going to charge it to 180 pounds of nitrogen on your gauge. And then you're gonna and then you're gonna break it. So if if it's 130, whatever the headmaster set to, that's what you're gonna put in the head of that of that headmaster in the diaphragm. And you'll find that so if you, uh, reading on the uh, headmaster itself. Yeah, it's stamped right on the body. Okay. It'll say LAC 180-4, and the uh, and the, the LAC is the the body style. The the number is the pressure. And the four is the connection size, half inch. Thanks. Hey, Jim, it might uh, also to point out, we've had a couple of instances on, uh, on some uh, walk-in freezers that have had uh, headmasters on them where uh, the valve itself, the uh, HPR is actually a dual setting valve or a dual set point valve. Uh, that could either be rated as 180 or 140. Uh, I may be uh, ill in advising, but I believe uh, you clip the uh, the stem on it process with the higher pressure. Yep. yep, yep, that's exactly right. So if you're dealing yeah. with a dual pressure one, then that that test will. But guys, if you clip it and then it starts to regulate down to that, you can still you can still charge up the head. All you're doing is clip an initial charge on the top of that head. So, yeah. but beware, again, look at your model number on those valves, guys. They'll tell you everything about them because I know that those dual pressure valves are also stamped accordingly. Yeah, they're, so, they're, stamped, they're stamped and they should be clipped to match the refrigerant. That's the, the reason that they're put in as a, as a dual set point is to match the refrigerant that that system's actually charged with. So, kind of, Something to, to keep an eye out for. We've had some, like I said, that have been uh, running that head pressure down way too low in the winter time, and you know that's what we ended up doing was uh, correcting that for the higher set point, and everything has been good. So something to point out. Oh, yeah, thanks, Sean. That's that's good. To, that's good to know. So guys, always look at your part numbers and know what you're dealing with. But I mean, and so just a hold back valve on a on a rack is the same concept, guys. So that's going to hold back pressure into that condenser to so that you lose capacity uh, on your condenser coil space for condensing. So and what that does is it maintains your head pressure to be able to keep your back pressure high enough to push down to the cases to get a good pressure drop across your valve. So again, do your checks, make sure your charge is adequate. So there's a lot of, you know, like I said, it's just understanding what those those are. I can't tell you how many return calls we get on ice machines. And then we go out and I've, I've actually taken a lot of customers away from other companies because they can't properly diagnose a headmaster on an ice machine. So if, if you if you go out there in the day and everything's running great, and then they call the next day and they say it locked out overnight and you go back and you reset it and everything's running great, think about the temperatures from day to night right now. That's your issue. So you need to go after that head pressure control and make and that mechanical control and see what it's doing. So do some tests on that. So cover the condenser, run it up, see what it does, run it down. Um, so once you guys understand the way that those valves are supposed to work, there's really a couple really easy checks to do. But you know, a lot of times that three those three pipes going into that valves confuses guys. It's not just there just to bypass. It's there to stack and bypass. So when, it's once a mixing that, valve. Once you cut that pigtail, oh. it uh, excuse me. Once you cut that pigtail, it uh, close off the refrigerant on the outlet of that uh, condenser coil and bypasses into the receiver. Is that what you're saying? No. Once you clip it, it's going to send everything through the condenser, so it's not going to bypass anything directly from the discharge to the receiver. So in a low ambient, so in, the guys do this a lot in the summertime. So if you're spring going into summer. A lot of guys will clip the pigtail and then they'll forget they ever did, and then we'll be back out there on the cold when it starts as soon as it starts to get cold because we're stacking. So what what I would say is, any time that you guys make the call to clip the pigtail, you're changing that valve. You're committed. 
So don't clip the pigtail unless you're ready to, you know, pull the gas out of that or be able to valve that off and change out that valve. Clipping the pigtail is a temporary fix. It is not a permanent solution. And I can't tell you how frustrating it is in the field when you guys walk up on these things and you see a pigtail that's, that's not only clipped, but then it's leaking refrigerant out of it and you're out of gas because somebody mm. clipped it two years ago and the diaphragm ruptured and it leaked out all the refrigerant. Mm, so if you clip it, you fix it. Yeah, company standard is you clip that pigtail, you better go back with the valve. Not to mention it could have been replaced when it was uh, 70 degrees outside and not minus 20. Yeah, That's good right. point. <laughs> Also, it, do you guys have any other questions on headmasters or head pressure regulating controls? Just be mindful of them restricting too. I've run into a few where they've restricted and you have to actually cut them out and bypass them to get through in the summertime. Be mindful of where you're checking that there's going to be a port on your discharge line. Check your pre pressure difference between your discharge line and your liquid line. Um, we had a, a compressor that kept just tripping on head pressure and no one could figure out why until uh, somebody gauged up to the right spot. So um, clipping the pigtail didn't seem to do any good on that one. Sometimes you got to cut them out and bypass them to get you by until you can get your new headmaster in. Good point, Sean. Thanks. And you said what, just put a straight T in there? Yeah, basically just bypass yeah. it. Just bypass it. Okay. But leave yourself enough room that you can put your new one in. I mean, don't yeah. obviously don't cut it so close to the other lines that you're going to have to repipe the whole world. I'm just I'm going to add just a little correction where he said put a straight T in. If we put a straight T in, we're going to be uh, running directly from our compressor to our receiver. So you'll actually um, want to pinch everything off and let it run through. Well, at least pinch off from discharge to the HPR and then let everything run through the condenser and pipe from the condenser to the receiver. Not, not just putting a straight T in. Pinch off this line and connect this to this. Okay. So the outlet of the condenser and the receiver uh, a free flow, and you'll pinch off right there at that T of that discharge, okay. Yep. Okay, I've seen that before. No, no. Any other questions? Concerns, comments? Okay. That is that. That's it. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. I have another one. What's up? Water